You're listening to the Truth About Bible Study taught by Pastor Dan Christians at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. So let's pray and then we'll get into our lesson today. Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for the truth we've already heard about the gospel and how you um, are using the foolish words of men and women um, to represent Christ and to share the good news of the truth of the gospel with Christ, that we can be saved and have eternal life. And Lord, we understand that with the gospel also comes those who believe it to be a message of death. And um, Lord, we just pray that this morning, as we look at your word again, you'd um, help us as your children to see the truth of your word and to uh, better represent that truth to the world around us, especially in this area of the sanctity of life and abortion. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be um, loving and kind, but wise and and honest and truthful um, with what your word says. We love you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first general topic we began speaking about after we got past the initial truth about truth, truth about morality, was the truth about the sanctity of human life. And under that umbrella, there are a number of very specific issues that we're going to tackle. And the first one, the one we'll spend the vast majority of our time on, is the truth about abortion. We'll probably spend at least this week and next week on this topic alone, and then we'll go through the other topics much faster once this one's done. Um, Norman Geisler said, Of all of the moral issues, the most pressing are those that involve life and death. And of the life and death issues, the one that bears on the most lives is that of abortion. And that is an understatement. The fact that it bears on the most lives, abortion is by far and away the leading cause of death. It is, it, we, we look at statistics, it is hard to begin to wrap our mind around the fact that the pastor is giving numbers today, 300 children a day in Canada alone are killed through abortion. It's just, the numbers are staggering. I, I got to tell you, even like last week, giving some of the statistics, It was difficult for me to stand up here and do that because it's just hard to say them out loud because you want to believe that they're not true, Um, but they are. And so what we're talking about this morning is of the utmost importance. Last week we saw that human life is precious to God because first of all, it was created by Him purposefully and mankind was created with a unique purpose, that we were created in His image, that we are loved and valued by God, that human life was protected before the law was given, that it was protected by the law once it was given, and that life is sustained by God. And I'm sure if we wanted to, we could go through the Bible and come up with a list of more reasons. But what we see when we look at Scripture very clearly is that God puts a high value on human life, that human life is of the utmost importance and it's worth protecting. Every human life on the earth has an eternal soul made in the image of God and Jesus Christ died to preserve human life. He died so that we could have life. And so we begin our discussion on abortion specifically last week. We saw some of the categories of artificial abortions. I'm going to give these to you again briefly just so because I think reminding you of them helps to remember. And I'm hoping that some of the things that we talk about in this class you'll remember going forward. But I also think that it's important for us to understand as we look at the history of abortion in Canada specifically, um, how different countries limit abortions and how we don't. And so we talked about six different kinds. We said there's a therapeutic abortion, which is for the physical health of the mother. And that eventually was extended to the, the mental health as well. But initially it was a therapeutic was for the physical health and a psychiatric abortion was for the mental health of the mother. A eugenic abortion was to prevent um, what they considered to be defects, so mental disabilities or physical disabilities. Uh, An ethical abortion is in the case of rape or incest. And so if a woman has been raped or if there's incest has has happened, then an abortion would take place simply because of the situation that the conception happened under. A social abortion is the ease of economic pressure And so if the child will be born into a poor family, then an abortion is seen as a better option than being poor. And abortion on demand is for any reason at all. So those are kind of the six categories 
um, that artificial abortions take place in. Again, an artificial abortion, what we'll refer to as just abortion, is the purposeful ending of life. So all around the world, 193 countries have abortion laws restricting abortion in some way or at some point. 193 countries. Three countries in the world do not have any such laws, China, North Korea, and Canada. Um, And so most countries say abortion is for therapeutic reasons, if it's going to be the health of the mother, or it's for the cases of rape and incest, or there's very specific cases. Um, A lot of countries, most countries won't let abortion take place after 20 weeks gestation. And uh, they have these laws in place. Canada does not. It's one of three countries in the world without any legal restriction on abortion. We'll talk about why that is in just a minute. Um, and you got to be true, to be honest with you, as, as I think about this fact and as we study this, um, there are times, you know when the Olympics are on and your country is competing and you just have this sense of national pride as your, you know, a member of your nation um, competes as well as they can, and they finish well, and they're they're proud of what they've done. And I mean, that, it, the Olympics this past few weeks it always stirs that within me. But it's been really sobering at the same time to study this and to think of this aspect of our country. Uh, there's, I mean, this is shameful that that we are one of three countries in the world. It's embarrassing. It's tragic, and um, I, I think we need to wake up to it a little bit. Uh, one of the things that has been interesting to me is. The fact that in the United States, where there are some laws, very few, but some, um, restricting abortion, uh, they talk about it all the time. It, it's an issue in just about every political race. It's something that's brought up a lot. Um, and in Canada, it's not. I was looking at a, a number of polls this week, and when people were responding about abortion, it was, it was somewhere around the 50-50 range whether people thought abortion should be allowed or not allowed. Okay. But the thing that struck me was that when they ask whether the laws should change, um, 33% say, no, they shouldn't change at all. 33% approximately say um, that the abortion laws should be less strict, which obviously those people don't understand that there aren't any laws, and so you can't make no laws less strict. And then 33% sh- say that it should be more strict. So, so even people, when they're answering that they think it's wrong, they're still not willing to say that we should change any laws, that we should do anything about it. We have a, a huge majority of the country that just would like to leave things the way they are. And that's unfortunate. Um, the, in the midst of this horrendous tragedy, there are a few positive things that I want to point out. And so it's not all doom and gloom. The number of abortions performed every year in Canada has been on a very gradual decline in the past 10 or 15 years. And they say somewhere around the number of 1% per year is declining. And that's a, that's a good thing. Um, though abortion laws are non-existent, doctors are permitted to act on their conscience. So no doctor is forced to perform an abortion. And in fact, no doctor is actually forced to Uh, refer someone to a place where they can get an abortion, a a doctor, the only thing that they have to do is they have to inform their patient about their own beliefs. So if if a doctor will say, uh, just so you know, uh, I don't believe abortion is an option, then they don't have to refer them or perform the abortion, which is a good thing that we still have. Um, According to an article in the National Post, very few doctors in Canada are willing to perform late-term abortions. And so though there's no laws in the books, most doctors see that as a very negative thing and they won't do it. Um, Although they are perfectly legal, they are not very common and sometimes hard to get. And so if somebody wants an abortion at 38 weeks, they're going to have to work really hard to find a doctor that's willing to do that um, because most won't. Uh, The abortion rate, if we were to take 1,000 women, this is how a lot of the world kind of rates their abortions, there there would be 15 abortions for every 1,000 women uh, alive in Canada. Uh, That is about in line with the number in most uh, developed countries around the world. The only exception in Canada is in Quebec, the number is 38 for every 1,000 women, which is two and a half times higher. It's, it's a pretty high number, higher. Um, 
in a pro-choice article I wrote, read this week, uh, or it said only one in six hospitals in Canada offers abortions. There is a looming shortage of doctors willing to provide the service. Many are approaching retirement and younger medical doctors are not replacing them. Some out of fear of harassment and others because they have not witnessed the dangers of unsafe abortions. And so you can see very clearly this approach to this article because they give some of the facts and then they give their reasons why that's happening. And so the fact is there seems to be less younger medical doctors willing to perform abortions than, than older medical doctors. And that's almost opposite of what I think we might expect. Um, but that is the case. And their reason for that is that they're either they're scared of being harassed or they have not seen the dangers of unsafe abortions. I think that their reason is because technology. We have the ability now to see so much detail inside the womb. We have so much information about the fact that this is a human baby. You can't deny it anymore. People can't hide behind it's just tissue. It's not just tissue. And so doctors are seeing this. They're going through the process, and eventually they're coming to places where they can't do it. And so that is a a good sign. Um, And so there's just a few positive things in the midst of this. I want to give you, I thought the, the, a lot of times we talk about the history of abortion in the States and we all understand Roe versus Wade and, and all those things, but I thought it'd be interesting to quickly walk through some of the history of abortion in Canada. And so in 1869, two years after the founding of Canada, all abortion for any reason was illegal. It remained that way for exactly 100 years. And in 1969, Pierre Trudeau's government passed a law that provided for abortions when the health of the woman was in danger. And it was determined by a three-doctor hospital committee called the Therapeutic Abortion Committee, or a TAC. And so hospitals were supposed to have these therapeutic abortion committees consisting of at least three doctors, and those three doctors would determine whether or not the woman who wants to have an abortion um, is having that abortion based on therapeutic reasons, so their, phys- their own physical health. Um, in 1977, there was something called the Badgley Report that came out, and it was a study on the operation of abortion law in Canada, and it found that because hospitals were not legally required to have a th- um, therapeutic abortion committee, only one in three actually did. Okay, so hospitals, though they were supposed to have one if they were going to perform abortions, only one in three hospitals actually even took the time to put the therapeutic abortion committee together. And when they looked at those hospitals that did have one, they found that they had very different rules for what a therapeutic abortion was. Because part of the problem was, it was never clearly defined what woman's health meant. And so you had some therapeutic abortion committees that would always say yes. If, if the request was given and they said, well, yes, it's going to be for my health, they didn't require any further reason. It was just, okay, sure, yeah, go ahead. And there were some, some therapeutic abortion committees that almost always said no, that they would never per- allow that to happen. And so what ended up happening is you had abortion that was accessible in very specific hospitals and in very large cities, and for many rural people, abortion was not still not accessible. And so this was seen as a, as a big problem. And probably the man who played the, the greatest or the worst or the largest role in changing how abortion is and, and changing to what it is now was a man named Dr. Henry Morgan Taylor. Morgan Taylor? Morgan Taylor. Do you know? Morgan Taylor. Okay, so Henry Morgan Taylor. Um, and he began opening up uh, illegal abortion clinics in Quebec. And so he would open up these clinics and then he would come out into the public and he would say, I have committed over 5,000 illegal abortions. And he's challenging people to take him to court. And so uh, he was taken to court a couple of times and both times he was taken to court, the jury found him not guilty, despite the fact that he was pleading guilty, essentially. He was saying, I had done it. And when the Quebec government um, appealed the decision, he was eventually placed in prison, supposed to be for 18 months, but partway through that, there was such an uproar in Quebec that they made a new law saying that if a jury 
condemn someone, then the government can't appeal that. And so then his appeal was thrown out, or the appeal on his trial, and he was, he was let out of prison. And so uh, the Quebec government, based on that, deemed the abortion law unenforceable. And so the law was technically on the books, but they were no longer going to attempt to enforce it. Uh, so over the next 15 years, Henry Morgenthaler began opening up abortion clinics in all other provinces as well. You just go everywhere and open up abortion clinics. And he was brought up and charged in Ontario a couple times. And the first time he was acquitted. The second time he was acquitted. And when the Ontario government appealed the decision, just like the Quebec government had done, Morgenthaler brought the matter before the Supreme Court. And so now the Supreme Court has to make the decision, and they're making the decision for all of Canada. And in 1988, the Supreme Court determined abortion laws violated Section 7 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Section 7 states, Everyone has the right to life, liberty, and the security of the person. Which, if you're paying attention, that's very ironic that they used Section 7 to call abortion laws um, illegal or unconstitutional. That, (laughs) That everyone has the right to life, liberty, and the security of person violated women's rights and their security of person, but it had never been determined that the baby inside the mother who was protected prior to this was not a person. And so their rights and their liberties and their security of person was was tossed out the window without ever ever that even becoming an issue, with that never being brought up. And so the conservative government, soon after that, led by Mulroney, quickly introduced Bill C-43, which passed through the elected House of Commons by nine votes in 1989. And Bill C-43 would have banned all abortions unless a doctor ruled that the woman's life, life or health would be threatened. And if you were found in violation of this, you would be in prison for up to two years. A few months later, the bill was brought before the Senate. And this is the unelected Senate, the appointed Senate. And the result was a tie vote. And a tie vote defeats the law. So one swing vote, and this law, Bill C-43, is passed. Now this is very unexpected that a a bill is going to go through the House and be passed the House is elected, and then go through the appointed Senate and not be passed. In fact, the last time it happened in Canada was 1941 prior to this. And so it was fully expected that eventually it would be brought back up and that the Senate would get in line. They would do what what they ought to have done in the first place. But um, (laughs) it was during this time that uh, the controversial GST... uh, uh, GST tax was instituted, and um, because this controversy was so great, and because the conservatives were under attack, one of the things that they did was they vowed that they would not bring up the abortion law again. And a lot of people think that part of the reason they were doing that is because they were trying to get this GST passed through the Senate, and so they didn't want to undermine the Senate's authority by bringing something back up that the Senate had already voted on. And so because of that, it was never brought up again, and no subsequent government has ever revisited the decision, and that's why we have no abortion laws in Canada. Because there was abortion laws, they were considered non-constitutional, the expectation is that there would be new laws put in place, but, but, but those laws were voted down, the new laws, the new idea was voted down, and it's never been revisited. And so now we're in just in a state where there's, there's zero laws whatsoever. Um, now, as I said before, doctors have their own codes and, and they have their own choice and, and all those things. But as far as um, criminal code, there's nothing in the criminal code regarding abortion. And so what I want to do now that you understand kind of history and, the, and the, the place that we're in right now in Canada is I want to talk a little bit about what the scripture says on abortion. Okay, Because we all come into this room with emotions about Um, what we think abortion should be or what it shouldn't be or whether it's right or wrong. And granted, many of us might be on the right side of the issue already or the side I consider right. 
But I think there's two questions that we have to answer biblically in order to determine whether or not we're, we're answering the question the right way. The first one is, is a human being's life worth protecting? Should there be laws protecting it? Does it have value? And we spoke about this last week, and I think the answer is yes. I think most people would agree the answer is yes. Human life deserves protecting. It's worth protecting. The second question, the most probably the, the question that, that all of this issue hangs on is, when is a living human fetus a human being? So when is that, those cells, considered a human being? So what I want to do is look at, hopefully, what the Bible says about this. We'll do that this week. And then next week, we'll get to um, logic and science and reason and some other reasons, uh, um, some other things that, that I think bring to bear upon this. But really, what we're doing is we're answering the question with the Bible, and then we're going to see what science and reason have to say about it and if, they, if it backs it up. And so, the, so it's important for us to understand that there is not one absolutely rock-solid, clear text that shows that thou shalt not take the life of a baby or a fetus in the womb of the mother. Okay, now I think there's something very, very, very close to this, and we'll get to that at the very end, because I'm going to leave it for the end because it's my favorite part. But there isn't one text, there's not a, a commandment that's like, thou shalt not kill, also, just so you know, that includes this particular person inside the womb of a mother. Um, there is also no text about drinking and driving, there's no text about marrying your dog. There's no explicit text um, that can clearly speak to a number of issues that we would see as clearly wrong, so we shouldn't be afraid of the fact that, that a lot of things in our culture and in, in, in our society, we just say, okay, what does the Bible say about this? Let's compare Scripture with Scripture, and let's figure out what the Bible's teaching would be. And so I want to give you eight reasons. Number one, God is the maker and giver of life. So what, what are some of the principles that bring to bear on this issue and I think the first one is God is the maker and the giver of life. This is seen is in Genesis. It is praised. He is praised for this throughout the entire Bible. In Acts 17, 25, it says, Neither is worshipped with men's hands, speaking of God. God is not worshipped with men's hands as though he needs anything. He is the one that gives all life and breadth and all things. And I like that because what it does is it separates those things. There's an and between them. So he gives life. And he gives breath, which is distinct from life. And he gives all things, which is distinct from breath. And so it's a pretty clear passage about God giving life and life being separate from just breath. Um, In Psalm 139, verse 13, David writes, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Okay, now that that sounds a little bit ambiguous to us. We don't exactly know what that means, but um, the NASB says it this way: "For you formed my inward parts; you wove me in my mother's womb." This is God doing a work inside the mother's womb, where He is forming and He is weaving together and He's making. So God is the maker and the giver of life. The next verse is, "I will praise Thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are Thy works." and that thy soul knoweth right well. In other words, I know it very well that what you've done in my mother's womb is just a fearful and wonderful thing. Number one, God is the maker and giver of life. Number two, children are a blessing from the Lord. Psalm 127 verse 3 says, Lo, children are an heritage from the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. So children shouldn't be thought of as negative things, um, things to be avoided. They're a blessing, a gift of God. And, and just for the record, um, when you have a, a woman who's not married and has sinned, the child is not the curse of that. Okay? The child is still a gift. It's still a blessing. Number three, children are not referred to by the same name, whether born or are, sorry, are referred to by the same name, whether born or unborn. Okay? This is an important thing to understand that when we look at the Old Testament, when the Bible, the Bible uses a few different words, but two words in particular to describe children or babies. The words are ben and yeled. And we see that both of these words are used to describe babies in the womb as well as young infants or children out of the womb. And so it's the same word describing both. In other words, the Bible doesn't make a distinction between what this thing is prior to birth and what it is after birth. 
And so we see in Genesis 25, 21, it says, Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren and the Lord was entreated of him and Rebekah, his wife, conceived and the children struggled together within her. Okay, so the children are struggling together within her. That word is ben, or sons. Genesis 27, 5 says, And Rebekah heard when Isaac spake unto Esau his son, his ben. Uh, the following verse, Rebekah spake unto Jacob, her son. So the same two children struggling within her are now being spoke, spoken of as the same word. So prior to giving birth, they're the children, the sons. After birth, they're the son, Esau, the son Jacob. Yeled, uh, in Genesis 30, 26, it says, Give me my wives and children for whom I have served thee, and let me go, for thou knowest my service, which I have done thee. Jacob wants his wives and his children. Clearly, he's speaking about the children that are already born. Otherwise, it'd be weird if he was like, I want my wives, but you can have the baby inside of her, right? <laughs> so he wants his born children. Exodus 21, 22 says, If men strive and hurt a woman with child, so a pregnant woman, so that her fruit depart from her, it's the same word, yeled. So it's clearly speaking about child or children. Same word, born or unborn. New Testament, same thing. Huos in the New Testament, in Luke one thirty six, Elizabeth conceived a son. So now the, this, this son is inside of her. In verse 57, Elizabeth brought forth a son. Now this, this son is out of her. Same thing, a huos. In Luke chapter 1, verse 41, we see the word for baby or young child is brephos. And in Luke 1, 41, it says, It came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe, or the brephos, leaped in her womb. In Luke 2, verse 16, it says, They came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. So now Jesus has been born. He's lying in the manger. It's the same word, brephos. Okay? So I don't want to belabor the point, but the fact is the Bible doesn't have a special word that is only ever used for a fetus. The Bible uses the same word for child or baby in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Number four, <clears throat> children are innocent. They cannot be punished for their father's crime according to the law. And at Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, it says, The soul that sins, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. Okay? And, and that's just to speak to, I think, one of the most difficult circumstances where it's the sin of the father. And so do we punish the, the baby in the womb for the sin of the father? And the Ezekiel would say, no. Number five, the pinnacle of Israel's sinfulness is seen in the killing of innocent children. Psalm 106 is a pretty devastating chapter that is bookended by wonderful praises of God. And in this chapter, we have the psalmist explaining about Israel's sin and going in detail about Israel's sin. But in the midst of this, he's praising God for God's salvation. And so in Psalm 106.6, it says, We have sinned with our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. He goes on to explain what he's talking about. He talks about lust, envy, idolatry, forgetting God, ingratitude toward God, unbelief, complaining, disobedience, and worldliness. So he's going through this whole list of sins, and it seems to come to a climax in verse 37. He says, Yea, so he's speaking about the children of Israel, what they were doing. He says, Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils, and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. Thus were they defiled with their own works and went a-whoring with their own inventions. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people. And so we have this whole list of sins that comes to what seems like the pinnacle sin of killing the innocent children, that they were killing their own children. And as a result, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against his people. Thankfully, in Psalm 106, verse 47, the, the psalm ends with, Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the heathen to give thanks unto thy holy name and to triumph in thy praise. 
Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting, and let all the people say, Amen, praise ye the Lord. So the idea of this is that even in the midst of this wicked and awful sin, even after listing the worst things, getting to the point where it's, and, I, and we were killing our own children, he's saying, but praise the Lord, there is still salvation, that God, that we can still call out to our God and save us. And, and this is wonderful news for anybody that's ever had an abortion. It's wonderful news for anybody that's been, ever been any part of that process, that there is still salvation um, offered, that we have a God who's still willing to save. And so the pinnacle of Israel's sinfulness is seen in the killing of innocent children. Number six, God has a plan for children in the womb. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, he says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Clearly, God, before Jeremiah was born, formed him, knew him, and had a plan for him. Isaiah 49.1 says, Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken, ye people, from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother. He had made mention of my name. Verse, chapter 49, verse 5 says, And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant. And so God called him from the womb. He made mention of his name. So he knew the name of Isaiah and he called him to be a servant. Galatians chapter 1, verse 15, Paul writes, But when it pleased, the, pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. And so the question we have to ask is, I know I'm giving some specific examples of Jeremiah and Isaiah and Paul, but is this only true of Jeremiah and Isaiah and Paul? Is God only forming Jeremiah in the womb and having a plan for Jeremiah? and, and, and having, Or does he know others by name? I think that they're just they're just giving examples because they're writing the Bible of what's true for everybody. That that God has formed everybody. Okay, and I think David makes that pretty clear in in Psalm one twenty seven. Um, but we see clearly here that God has a plan for children even in the womb. Number seven, John the Baptist responded to Jesus' presence before birth. It would be very weird to think of a clump of cells doing this. In Luke chapter 1, verse 44, it says, For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And it's rare. It's not something we're expecting to happen with babies all over the place. But it just shows that, that there was a response to the presence of Christ even in the womb of Elizabeth. <clears throat> number eight, and this is the one we'll spend the rest of our time on. I've actually been rushing everything else because I wanted to make sure I got to this today. Um, the punishment for killing an unborn child is death. Here, I think, is the most important text as it relates to this specific issue in the Bible. Exodus chapter 21, verses 22 to 23. Okay, I'm going to read the verses in the King James, and then I want to know what you think they mean. Okay, initially what you think they mean, or what they could mean. It says, If men strive and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her, yet no mischief follow, he shall surely be punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judge determines. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. Initial response. Yeah, I think uh, if he does something to cause her to uh, deliver that baby premature, okay. and he lives. I think yep. that's what he's talking about. That okay. the baby dies. Right? Okay. Good. Yep. Okay. Mother of the child. But I hope you realize that. I mean, that's certainly that's where we're going to go with this, but. This is a text that's actually been used by a lot of pro-choice advocates to say, no, listen, the Bible teaches here that there is a different punishment for the killing of a baby as it would be for the killing of a mother. And so I'll, I'll read you the two ways of, of reading this. It says, if men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her. 
And so the first group would say, so that her fruit or so that her baby or, or so that the child is miscarried. Okay, so that so the, the child dies. And yet no mischief follow. In other words, there's no further hurt to the woman. He shall surely be punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judge determines. So the first group would say, the baby dies, the woman is still alive, and so now they're going to go to a judge to determine what the person who did that has to pay. Which still means it was a bad thing, right? It's still negative, but it's not the law of life for life. In other words, the value of the woman's life would be seen differently than the value of the mother's life. It goes on in the next verse and says, if any mischief does follow, then it will be life for life. So if if the woman dies, then it will be life for life. That's the way that the pro-choice advocates would read this. And so the question is, is that a legitimate way? Okay. The other way of reading it is if... If, if two men are fighting and the, a, a woman is hurt and it causes her to give birth prematurely, but no mischief follow, meaning the child and the mother are both healthy, then there still is a punishment. There's still, they'll still go to a judge and the husband will bring that person to a judge if he feels necessary. And the judge will determine what they have to pay just for the fact that the baby was born prematurely. Okay? But if mischief does follow, in other words, if either the baby or the mother is killed, then it will be life for life. Those are two ways of reading it. Okay? So the question is, which one is um, the best? How do Bible translations fare? I thought since we did our Bible study, uh, a Bible translation class, it'd be interesting to take this verse and look at Bible translations. Um, I think the King James Version and the American Standard Version keep it confusing. Okay, they just say the child departs. And whether the child departing, what, is, what does that mean? That's, that's the question. And they don't make any decision. Um, I actually think that, that the word child departs there is a bad translation. I, I think that they, they picked the wrong word. Um, the message, the new revised standard version, and the good news translation believe the child dies. And so they use the word miscarriage. And so they're going with the, very, the first way that would be the more pro-choice way. The, the NIV, the NLT, the ESV, the NASB, the HCSB, the NET, the WEB, the NKJV, and the voice, and a, a list of others, believe that it's a premature live birth. So the baby is born live. Um, and I'm hoping I hit any translation that you've read or, or likely heard of. I, I made sure I hit all the top ten. So I looked at all of them. And so th- that's, that's kind of how they see it. So, if we were to dive into this ourselves, what would we find? <clears throat> um, there are three, four reasons that I believe that understanding this to be the death of the child is wrong. That it's not speaking about the death of the child. There's four reasons I think it's speaking about the premature birth of a live child. The first one is, the word is used, yeled which is the same word used hundreds of times in the Old Testament meaning child. So even though the the King James uses the word fruit there, the word is actually child, and the only time it's ever translated fruit is in this verse. So child makes a lot more sense to say, and the child dies. Fruit is just used. Um, The second one is, the word for depart does not at any point mean die, but it rather means to go out. So the depart is the word yatsa. It means to go or to come out or to bring out. In, For example, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 2, it says, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So you get this picture that they're in the house of Egypt, that they've been brought from this place. They've been brought out or they've come out of that place to a new place. Um, Exodus chapter 21, verse 2 says, If thou buy a Hebrew serpent, six, servant, Six years he shall serve thee, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. So if he's in this case, after seven years, he can go out and be in a, in a different um, circumstance. Okay, So that's what the word generally means. I used Exodus 20 and 21 because they are surrounding the context of this verse. Same author, same chapter. So I thought it'd be helpful to actually get it. This is what the same word means in the same chapter, just in a different setting. Um, So the second reason is the word for depart does not mean die, it rather means to go out. Number three, the word yatsa, 
when used with regard to pregnancy, refers to a live birth everywhere in the Bible unless it's qualified. So, in Genesis chapter 25, verse 24, it says, When her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out, the first yatza, red, all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came out his brother also. Okay, so we have the same word yatza being used in, with regard to a live birth. We see the same thing in Jeremiah 1.5, a verse we've already talked about. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctify thee. So before I yatza, I sanctify thee. Whenever yatza refers to a stillbirth, so a baby that has died, it is qualified to say that. So in Numbers 12.12 12, and in Job 3.11 are the two examples in, in the Bible when a baby is born and it's stillborn, it's, it's born dead. And the Bible says it came out dead. So it qualifies the fact that it came out how, or how it came out. Otherwise, it's always a live birth. So I think it'd be very strange for us to all of a sudden see this word come forth and say, oh no, it's clearly speaking about, to, the word depart would mean a dead child. It doesn't mean that anywhere in scripture unless it says a child that was born dead and the word for dead is there. It's not. So the word yatza, when with regard, used with regard to pregnancy, refers to a live birth unless qualified. And finally, the word for miscarriage, which is shakol, was not used. In Exodus 23, 26, it says, There shall be nothing cast their young, nor be barren in thy land. The number of thy days I will fulfill. And the word for cast their young is lose their young. So the NASB translates it, There shall be no one miscarrying or barren in your land, I will fulfill the number of your days. So if it was speaking about a miscarriage, there's a Hebrew word that would have signified that very clearly. So when we're looking at this verse again, with that in mind, we see, if men strive and hurt a woman with child, the word child, a woman with child, actually that's not the word, that it's just a woman that's pregnant, so that her fruit or her child departs or, or is born, from her, comes forth from her, and yet no mischief follow, it seems very clear. It's saying, if the child is born, so they're fighting, the child is born, but there's no mischief. There's nothing terrible that's happened. There's no problem. He shall be punished. So he's still going to be punished, but the punishment isn't life for life. It's just some kind of fine. But if any mischief follow, so if if the baby doesn't depart and, is, and, and there's no mischief, there, there's nothing wrong, mischief follow, then it's life for life. And it seems to me like that's referring back to whether the mother or the child dies. There's not, there doesn't seem to be a distinction made. So when we're looking at this verse, I think if you actually consider the words used in this verse, and, and not just, you know, this is the translation I've chosen, but you look at the words, it seems abundantly clear to me that this is saying that the punishment for killing a child in the womb is the same as the punishment for killing a, any person out of the womb, according to the law. And so we will end there today. Um, I hope what, what we've done today is just, just reaffirm in your minds uh, what, what you probably already believed about abortion, or most of you what you believe about abortion. Um, but what I want to do is I want to ground that belief firmly in Scripture. Okay, I'm going to close with this verse from Proverbs 31. Verse 8 and 9 says, Open your mouth for the dumb, or for those who can't speak, in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open your mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. The Bible commands us to be speaking on behalf of those who don't have a voice. All right, so thank you everyone. Good job. See you in a bit.